Hey everybody, it's Eric Torenberg, co-founder, partner of Village Global, a network-driven venture firm. And this is Venture Stories, a podcast covering topics relating to tech and business with world-leading experts. Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of Venture Stories by Village Global. I'm here today with a very special guest, Jim Rutt. Jim is an entrepreneur, technologist, thinker, former chairman of the Santa Fe Institute, now a research fellow. Jim, welcome to the podcast. Hey, thanks, Eric. Great to be here. Jim, I'm curious what, what you would add or edit to that intro, but but more more precisely, when you think of the various different threads that uh, underlie your, your career, what, what do you think ties them together? Because you've done a lot of different and interesting things. What, what sort of unifies them? Yeah, it's funny you mentioned that because I was actually talking with that about that at lunch the other day. Someone said, you know, you got a rather curious career. You've done all kinds of crazy shit, right? Uh, what <laughs> possibly could organize all that stuff? Uh, and the answer, I believe, honestly, is I've always had a essentially subconscious ability to sniff where the edge is. And uh, I want to sort of be near the edge. Uh, if I find myself in an area that's too comfortable, it's starting to settle down, uh, it's time to move on. It's kind of like Daniel Boone, right? He'd always say, when I can see the smoke from another man's cabin, it's time for me to move on. And it used to drive my people nuts in business. As soon as things got settled and our startups were making money and or business units were making money and everything was working reasonably well, I'd say, well, it's time to pass this off on to somebody else. I'm going to go start something else. And they go, God damn it, we're just to the point where we can enjoy it. And I go, yeah, it's just where I find it boring. So uh, <laughs> Uh, I, I, I think it's the old Daniel Boone spirit that uh, I'm never happy when things are too calm. And I'm yeah. always hence looking for uh, where the ragged edge is and where something new might be. And is, is there sort of a, a, in terms of what guides where you spend your time now, is it sort of a top down you know, mission um, that you, you're trying to adhere to or, 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 or accomplish or, or serve? Or uh, is it more bottoms up? sort of, you know, sniffing out where the, where the interesting stuff is or both. Yeah. It's, I think it's, you know, both and, or both, you know, both and, uh, that, uh, you know, I basically just do what the hell I feel like. And, uh, you know, for instance, my podcast, the Jim Rutt show, by the way, right. Uh, I just started it on a sort of a lark to see if I'd like doing it. And I did. And I found it also then plugged into some of my other missions, which I wasn't clear that it would, such as, Uh, trying to think about what comes next with respect to our social operating system. And I started bringing some of the people from that world onto my podcast, which kind of got me re-engaged with those people. And uh, so I would say I have no scheme, neither top uh, down nor bottom up. I do what I want, follow my nose, uh, tend to drift towards where the action is. And uh, that's basically it. Let's get into the social operating system, but let's sort of uh, start with the the history. Uh, There's this concept Gain B that that's seeming to gain steam that you either helped originate or or were were around uh, early uh, you know, maybe 2012 2013 and and it manifested in something you and and uh, a colleague of yours I believe Jordan Hall came up with called the Emancipation Party. Well, why don't we get into some of the the history? Explain what this all means. Explain some of the history and and what what led to you guys coming up with that idea. Jordan Hall and I, then Jordan Greenhall, met, I think it was in 2007 or 2008, uh, when we were both trustees at the Santa Fe Institute. He was a, a new trustee, and I was had been a trustee for about six years at that point, I think, five years. And after the meeting, uh, we just decided to sit down and chat. We had like a four-hour conversation. I go, holy shit, you know, here's another person who sees the world kind of like I do in a way of, uh, you know, as a series of networks with signaling systems, et cetera. And, and is applying that point of view fairly critically to our current system. And we both agreed we did not like the current status quo. Uh, and initially, it was on moral ethical grounds, right? I was actually telling a story how when I uh, joined the business world in 1975, when I graduated from college, uh, the first two companies I worked for, uh, I would say, were actually honorable and ethical companies with uh, good people running them, et cetera. But over time... I saw the ethos of business being more and more cutthroat until sometime in the early 90s, at least for the majority of companies, particularly larger companies, the ethos was, uh, uh, you know, is it arguably legal and profitable? If so, I'll do it. Uh, And Jordan, about 20 years younger than I am, uh, maybe a little bit less than that, said, 
shit, you know, when I joined the uh, business world in 1994, that was exactly the ethos, right? And, uh, uh, you know, I never liked it, but, you know, it was what I had to confront. And uh, doesn't that suck? And then we then quickly developed, I would say it's the foundational statement or two about our relationship. Because we do disagree on a fair number of things, but we always find ways to cooperate and work together, uh, which is that it's a damn shame that a society be structured such that an approach of honesty and good faith is a sucker strategy, right? Uh, And that by itself ought to be a thermometer on whether a a, a social operating system is a righteous one or not. Uh, If to to operate in honesty and good faith is the sucker strategy, uh, then the society sucks. And uh, that was essentially what we both agreed our current society uh, uh, was like. And we've now since updated uh, you know, arguably legal and profitable to, uh, you know, arguably legal or uh, the calculated penalties for getting caught are smaller than the profits. So therefore do it. Right. Uh, and uh, that's the ethos of, you know, big business today. We see it all the time. I mean, these guys are constantly getting caught. You know, so the book surveillance capitalism goes again and again and again into how Google just fucking lies to everybody about their business practices. Right. Uh, and they get caught and they get their hands slapped. But they recently got paid 100, had to pay a $180 million fine or something in the process, building a $500 million billion dollar company. Uh, that's just uh, the way it goes. You know, Uber being the, you know, the probably the most extreme example or one of, they just said, fuck everybody, fuck all the rules. We're just going to do what the hell we want. Uh, yeah, you can catch us after the fact, but in the meantime, we're going to build a, you know, a mega unicorn. And it worked, right? Uh, you know, because they've hacked, the uh, political system. Uh, the political system is now a pawn of big business and big money, right? And so that's basically part of how we got there. To, but the other one is, is, is that I think, a um, cultural moral thing, which emerged in the 70s and gained speed in the 80s, uh, which was this concept that the only purpose of business is to maximize shareholder value, period, Right. And if you look at the history of the corporate form, you know, the limited liability entity, whether it's a, an S corp, C corp, LLC, anything that uses limited liability, uh, the history of that is those charters were given out uh, relatively sparingly, typically by state legislatures or in you know, other places by the uh, national government for a specific purpose of social utility for like building roads or canals or operating a port uh, or something like that. Later, the corporate form was let off the uh, been let off the leash essentially to go and just do whatever the fuck it wants, uh, so long as it uh, maximizes shareholder value. You know whether it's uh, uh, you know good for the people around uh, or not, and uh, that was considered a edgy proposition when I was in college in the seventies. You know that was advocated by the Ann Randians, right? And I'll confess, I was an Ann Randian at one point, right? You know, what smart 15-year-old wasn't, right? Uh, but hopefully you've said, uh, uh, by the time you're 25, you see through that and go, all right, yeah, maybe, it would, you know, it would work if everybody had an IQ of 130, which, of course, is uh, oxymoronic because uh, since uh, IQ is based on a, on a uh, Gaussian distribution, you can't have everybody with an IQ of 130. Anyway, that ethos bubbled up from there. And if you look at uh, some of the, you know, practitioners in the political space, they, you know, uh, Newt Gingrich and uh, Paul Ryan, et cetera, a lot of them will, you know, still confess to, you know, worshiping at the altar of Ayn Rand and the idea that, uh, you know, this buccaneer business dude, right, who fucks everybody and makes it for themselves, right? You know, it was a minority view uh, in the 70s, uh, in the early 70s, and probably at the end of the 70s, it was, still a minority view in the country as a whole, but may have been a majority view in the new entrepreneur uh, world. And that then uh, gradually uh, percolated out to the business world. It was also driven by some interesting technical innovations. You know, the uh, uh, junk bond, uh, you know, debt raiders who took over the big bland corporations and downsized them, chopped them up, whatever. And oh, by the way, I actually think that was good in many ways. Bland 50s and early 60s, big corporate uh, capitalism was a different kind of nightmare, you know, a nightmare of conformity and horseshit, right? And so the Raiders uh, broke that up, but they then replaced uh, kind of bland uh, managerialism uh, with ruthless uh, uh, red and blood and claw hyper capitalism. And that probably wasn't the right thing to replace it with. So uh, those are some of the drivers, you know, that 
that seemed to me at least to be uh, what have, has led this very late in the day hyper capitalism to this uh, current point where it's essentially uh, spinning crazily out of control, driven by a logic of its own. Uh, you know, it's no longer the people in charge. It's money on money return. You know, think about somebody like Zuckerberg. I mean, he had no reason to go public. Damn company was uh, profitable from the get go. He had all the money he needed. Uh, and initially he sounded like he wanted to do good things in the world with it. Uh, but for reasons unknown, uh, he succumbed to taking his company public. Uh, and then he's caught in the goddamn whirlwind. Money on money return, particularly short term money on money return, uh, becomes the decider of everything. Right. Uh, so no surprise. He takes all these smart people who are going to build this platform for humans to uh, level themselves up and instead turn it into a uh, dopamine button pusher to capture as much attention as possible, to agitate people as much as possible, uh, to learn as much about people as possible, to sell your attention to the highest bidder for the most amount of money possible. So that's uh, that's what happened. You know, is Zuckerberg a bad guy? I don't know Zuckerberg. Probably not a bad guy. Uh, but uh, because of the, the game that he sucked, allowed himself to be sucked into, the vortex of money on money return, Facebook has become probably on net a very bad influence on our civilization. Before uh, getting into the game being the, f- the fifth attractor, I want to sort of yeah, uh, uh, make sure we summarize all, all the good stuff we just said. So if, if you had to, to, you know, uh, to, to rephrase or resummarize the last 40 years, there's, the game has gotten more rigged because because why because cultural changes because um because it worked because people got it rich or why did was it inevitable that things would, would happen th- this way the increasing financialization or or sort of uh riggedness i guess as you say why, why did this happen and was it inevitable that it would that well you know culture it was part of it the other was technology right the invention of the junk bond right the invention of venture capital uh the things came together uh it was a perfect storm typically Big things don't happen because of one uh, cause. You know, this was a you know multi-causal, and then uh, another big one, huge, is that our political operating system got hacked by money. Right? It didn't used to be that American politics was utterly dominated by big money, and interestingly, that era may be ending. But for the period, say from 1980 to 2016. Uh, maybe a little before 2016, it was dominated and truthfully still is at the lower level races by money. Uh, So for instance, antitrust enforcement has essentially become a joke since 1980 with a few uh, typically politically motivated exceptions. Uh, You know, look at the concentration in the beer industry. You know, back in the 30s, uh, the antitrust authorities basically rejected mergers that would have produced a single beer company that had more than three, that's 3% of the beer market. Uh, you know, now we have InBev, which has 40% of the beer market. Uh, and of course, uh, this kind of consolidation is really good for the people doing the consolidating. Uh, and at least in the long haul, is not likely to be too good for the consumers. Anybody notice price of beer has gone up in the last couple of years? Uh, price of wheat hadn't gone up. Price of corn hadn't gone up. Price of barley hadn't gone up. Uh, it's basically monopoly or oligarchic rent extraction uh, due to overconcentration in the industry. Uh, so I would say you know, it's a number of things. So you want to hop back to a little bit more of the history of Game B, how, you know, this was sort of my early, this was the four hour conversation with Jordan. And then from there, you know, I then uh, stayed in touch, uh, uh, you know, loosely by email, you know, every couple of months. And, you know, we continue to do our own independent research and what the hell's going on. I happened to jump into, uh, monetary thinking. I had come to the conclusion to thinking about our social operating system as a, a series of complex systems and signaling networks, that the root of it all was uh, that the actual nature of our monetary system. And so I started researching, okay, what is money, right? Uh, money is a very interesting thing. Uh, your average person, you know, thinks that, uh, you know, Frank, or doesn't think, but assumes that, you know, our current uh, central banker mediated fractional reserve banking system, you know, was brought down from Mount Sinai by Moses or something, right? The truth of the matter what is, it's been a whole series of frozen accidents that happened for a bunch of weird reasons, and it is what it is. And it has very specific functional attributes as a signaling system, and its coupling to the economy have very 
you know, very specific attributes that aren't necessary. You know, you could design a monetary system that had very different attributes. And it's also important to remember uh, that until fairly recently, uh, monetary policy, monetary theory was a big part of U.S. politics, right? Uh, 1900, uh, what's his name? Uh, William Jennings Bryant uh, ran on bimetallism. Uh, you know, thou shalt not crucify mankind on a cross of gold, right? You know, uh, carpenters and plumbers were talking about uh, monetary theory at the pub, right? Uh, now nobody talks about it. They think that our current monetary system is just the monetary system, uh, and it's not. So anyway, I ended up reading 50 books and a couple hundred uh, uh, scientific papers on the topic, so related thoughts to how all that coupled to society uh, partic- and then also to how finance, the financial services industry, had become a predatory beast uh, that was essentially an industry that was manufacturing opacity for the purposes of increasing its share of uh, the economy. In fact, uh, that reached a high water mark around 2006 or 2007, where according to uh, some sources, uh, the financial uh, services industry, including real estate and insurance, uh, was extracting 40% of all corporate profits out of America, right? Now, that's fucking nuts, right? Here, it's essentially a middleman uh, ministerial industry that had historically been taking 10 to 15%, and even that seems a little rich to me, uh, had now uh, milked things up to 40%. And I threw that into my mix, too. And, uh, you know, I was thinking about all this for, you know, several years. And then in uh, late 2011, I started writing it up. I wrote Ended up uh, finishing it, and I think in uh, March of 2012, a 65-page, uh, fairly dense thing uh, that I called the Tome at the time. Eventually, got called the Root Doc. I circulated to a few folks, including Jordan and four or five other people, and they all said, "Hey, there's some, something interesting here. What are we going to do about this?" And I'm like, "I don't know. Let's get together." And so we all got together face to face in Stanton, Virginia, and said, "Well, what the hell should we do about this?" And uh, uh, I said, "Well, hmm." You know, one, one thing we could do is start a political party. Uh, in retrospect, it was kind of a naive idea. We didn't know dick about political parties. And if anything, we probably are exactly the wrong kinds of personality to be doing political parties, you know, more analytical and thinkers and what have you, not necessarily uh, professional rabble rousers. Though I suppose I could probably be a pretty good professional rabble rouser if I were so inclined. Uh, <laughs> but I'm not so inclined. Uh, and uh, But nonetheless, we went ahead and we recruited some other folks. And you know, through the summer and into the fall of uh, 2012, we created this thing called the Emancipation Party. Uh, and interestingly, we, uh, I, I, it was its website had been down for, I don't know, six months or a year. But recently, based on a conversation on another podcast, I decided, let me see if I can bring the sucker back to life. It turned out it was, you know, 20 minute job. And it's now back up emancipationparty.org. And we had a whole series of reforms that we uh, propose and you know when you look at them, you go. That's actually not a bad uh, a bad group of reforms uh, to change the world. We were proposing in 2012 something we called the citizenship wage, which is now called that now called uh, uh, universal uh, basic income. Uh, we were advocating a new money system, right? Completely new, trash the current money system. Now it's very different than Bitcoin, blockchain, public ledger uh, type things, but it was, uh, you know, proposing it's time to actually fundamentally change out our uh, monetary system. Uh, You know, we talked about fixing money in politics. We talked about radically reforming uh, intellectual property. We talked about an end to the drug war. We talked about universal health care. We talked about them in some detail. I would, you know, if people want to see what some people were thinking about in 2012, uh, and early 2013, you know, go to the org and take a look. It's uh, some interesting stuff. We also identified a, a way to trigger uh, such a transformation, which is to start raising the idea of a debt jubilee. Uh, and we came to a very interesting idea called the jubilee ratchet, which uh, works as follows. As the fear of jubilee increases, I mean, even if it's tiny, you know, let's say people in financials, in the financial markets, I think there's a one-tenth of one percent chance that a jubilee could occur in five years. Logically, at least, that ought to eventually flow through to a tenth of one percent uh, divided by five, uh, 0.02 uh, percent increase in interest rates on five-year debt. Over time, as assuming this political process had been successful, 
as uh, the, the perceived risk of Jubilee gets higher and higher, that ought to raise interest rates and ratchet them up and up and up. As, they, uh, as interest rates go up uh, due to fear of Jubilee, guess what? More people get pissed off at the debt burden they have. More people uh, join the debt Jubilee movement, which then raises interest rates again. So you get a virtuous circle, uh, which uh, I did some fairly humorous uh, agent-based modeling on, and I came up with a precise uh, calculation that in 11 years, it would crush the financial system. Obviously bullshit in terms of an actual prediction, uh, but that dynamic model actually did work with some plausible assumptions about uh, recruitment and defection and things of that sort. So anyway, that was the Emancipation Party. We went out and tried to market it. Uh, we were abysmal failures. I think we got like 250 members or something. And uh, being business guys, if not particularly good consumer marketers, uh, we said, well, let's find out why we didn't work. This didn't work too well. So we went out and talked to some of the people we've been talking to and other people. And we found that actually baby boomers kind of like this thing. Gen Xers were okay on it. And there was enough take rate there. We could have actually built out a uh, pretty good size organization. But was very discouraging was boomer. Uh, the, the Millennials hated it. Hated it. Zero. Zero take rate for millennials. Uh, almost zero. And we then decided, ah, this is very interesting. Because obviously the future in 2012 was about millennials. Now it's about the next generation, whatever they're being called. And uh, so we decided we'd drill into what millennials uh, were thinking. And we came to this big aha, the, the pure concept of a political party, even if it had a bunch of righteous reforms, which they mostly agreed with, which ours did, the idea itself of a political party was poisonous. And they wanted nothing to do with something called a political party. And so that gets us up to January 2013, where we convened our group, which this time was about 25 people, I think, and said, all right, what the hell are we going to do here? Uh, this political party idea doesn't appeal to millennials at all, at least not in the form that we're presenting it. And it's kind of stupid to try to sell something just to boomers and Xers. You know, if you can't sell millennials, it's not the future. Uh, so let's think about it. And at that point, uh, Jordan came up with an idea at the whiteboard. And he basically said, Hmm, what we need is something that's not political at all, but it's rather cultural uh, and as an on-ramp uh, and as a way of thinking about living uh, that is different, but is nonetheless congruent with the deeper ideas of the political party. And we tested that very vague concept out with millennials. And it was like, fuck yeah, that sounds great. And then, then we asked them, well, what did we just say? And they didn't have any idea. And that's actually been quite interesting to this day. Uh, game B is this partially empty bag that people, you know, put their own beliefs, hopes, fears, and uh, ambitions into. So we said, oh, that's just kind of interesting. So uh, uh, we started thinking, well, what are some good things that might be in game B? And we you know, made some little bit of good work about it. And, uh, and then, interestingly, the group itself kind of decided it was much more interested in this game B, whatever the hell it was, than it was in the political party. And so the most of the energy, probably 75%, 80% of the people uh, moved towards this game B thing. And, uh, you know, it kind of evolved. But And then we had some very interesting additional meetings face-to-face -face every six weeks in little old Stanton, Virginia, population 25,000. But truthfully, we never made any great progress in re being real specific about what game B was, other than it was the opposite of game A, which is the status quo, right? Uh, but, but, you know, there was some basic agreement that it would be different signaling systems, uh, intrinsically network-based, uh, uh, anti-hierarchical, uh, peer-based, uh, not hyper-capitalistic, but probably market-driven. I think we're all market. We believe the market is one of the great inventions of humanity, uh, but hyper-financialized markets aren't. Uh, I think we were unclear about what politics might be under game B. But anyway, so this thing starts to form up, but uh, then it runs into some problems, which I have uh, heard from other people who've gone down similar roads are not that unusual, which is that we ended up with two dimensions of fissures in the group. At this point, the group's maybe 50 people. So it's not a huge group, uh, you know, people who are actively working on this game B. And I've described the fissures at fissure as Two, So you end up with four cells, which had some weird overlap. Uh, the first was the distinction between those people who thought that we needed to be focusing on institutions, right? 
like what is a better signaling network than money, right? Or what's a better kind of money than our current kind of money? Or uh, what's a better kind of uh, societal governance market, uh, governance uh, uh, modality than first past the post uh, elections with two political parties, right? So I'll call it the institutionalist tendency. And then the other was the personal change tendency. It says, well, you know, we can't even start to think about institutions till we change as people, right? And uh, that was pretty strong division. Then there was a second division, um, which uh, basically uh, were uh, those who, uh, I don't know, I guess you'd call it the woo-woo sorts, you know, uh, versus the uh, scientific realists. And of course, there's some significant overlap between the personal change and the woo-woos, right? But I will say that not all personal change people were woo-woo. Uh, so again, we had a complicated uh, kind of faction and it turned ugly, got real personal. You know, we had to give people 90 day timeouts, you know, there was screaming and yelling, you know, uh, ac uh, accusations, uh, uh, accusations of bad faith. So I don't think there were actually any, I, I do believe these were honest disagreements, at least as far as I know. But uh, anyway, uh, after a while, uh, we just got sick and fucking tired of it. At least I did. I think Jordan did too. We said, fuck this shit, right? Uh, if this group, if a group of 50 people can't go here, uh, then we just need to step back and rethink. And so uh, I think something like August uh, 2013, something like that, we just said, all right, you know, let, th there are some cool ideas here. And we basically communicated to everybody, think of game B as this initial thought about things that are different in a way that could be that might save the world right, might be that social operating system that avoids ecocide and, you know, mega collapse. However, we haven't got it thought out. Each of you take these spores of what we have left, and we left the base camp site up, which was full of all this stuff, including documents and videos and PowerPoints and uh, invective and all kinds, you know, good arguments, all kinds of stuff. And, and feel free just to hang out here and, you know, mine it for your own material, but don't post anything new. I'm going to freeze them all. It's all there for you. It's read only, but uh, yeah, it's there. Which website was it? Was this Emancipation Party or a different? Uh, this was Game B. This was the Game B base camp site, which still exists. I've kept it in frozen mode uh, ever since, because I think it might have some historical interest if Game B comes to life. So anyway, take these spores, go out in the world, and if you're interested, you know, go do it, you know, or not, right? And maybe in the future, the spores will germinate and Game B will turn into, uh, into something uh, new and interesting. And interesting, like many of the people did keep uh, Game B as part of their identity. You know, you'll see people here and there that have Game B on their Twitter uh, uh, definition, et cetera. Uh, you know, a good friend of mine, uh, Brett, uh, 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 Weinstein is a game beer, right? Uh, basically on his own trajectory. And, uh, you know, I personally went off, did other things. I, uh, uh, to, in January, 2014, decided to deeply immerse myself in uh, cognitive science, cognitive neuroscience, uh, scientific study of consciousness, and then soon got engaged in uh, helping out projects in uh, very advanced AI, artificial general intelligence. And uh, so I kind of went that way. Didn't think about Game B too much other than, you know, I talked to Jordan, talked to some of the other uh, people, talked to Brett, uh, you know, a couple, few times a year and uh, kind of let it be. But these spores did continue to percolate out. And I think in particular, uh, you know, Jordan Hall uh, met up with some new cast of characters in San Diego, uh, Daniel Schmattenberger, Forrest Landry, and a few others. I don't necessarily know who they are. And I think they resonated with each other and they resonated with this core idea of game B and they have made, done, made a lot of progress in starting to fill out this. What is that? What the hell is this game? No, by no means even close to done. It's still all right. Well, you know, everyone has their own kind of vision of what game B is, but there's a lot more to it now than there was before. And somehow uh, the call has gone out into the world in some tenuous fashion. And I see the, you know, the Game B people starting to recoalesce. What's resonated or, or why? It seems like recently, last like month or two, like it seems to really have picked up steam. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, yeah, I really don't know. The, uh, you know, I, I've kept another thing going, again, mostly just as a, a crossroads for the old community. 
uh, Game B group on Facebook. So just type in Game B in the search box and you can find it. Uh, something's happened. We had nine people apply for membership last night. Uh, you know, it used to be like one a month, right? Something's happening. Uh, there's a group of people on Twitter who are pulling together and trying to document Game B and organize uh, Zoom meetups and all kinds of stuff. You know, I think uh, Daniel Schmottenberger and, and Jordan have been moderately active doing uh, podcasts and videos and stuff. And I will say, uh, possibly my own podcast was a little ripple in space uh, where I did back-to-back pretty deep uh, interviews on the Jim Rutt show with uh, Daniel Schmottenberger and Jordan Hall. And uh, Jordan at least believes that that ripple may have been one of the little things that has caused uh, you know, as I said before, a lot of different things going on at once seems to have caused something to start happening again. But I would also not discount the real work that the San Diego group has been doing quietly for a few years. They now actually have something to talk about. And I think what they have to talk about is interesting and valuable. Not that I agree with it in every particularity, uh, but I think the fact that there is when people do say, well, what the hell is this game be? Now, there's at least somebody out there who can start to answer that. I think that makes a big difference as well. And, and what have they figured out or what are they starting to answer? It, and is it more the personal change, spiritual fa- faction or, or what is it that, that they figured out? Uh, no, this is, of course, you know, I should have you know, punched myself, right? The, the right answer in 2012, uh, 2013 is what it always is in the social sciences. Both, motherfucker, right? It's never nurture versus nature. It's nature and nurture. In this case, it's personal change and it's new institutions. And I will strongly credit the San Diego interpretation as they have really realized that. And everything they do uh, takes the two together, right? Uh, That we need new institutions, but, you know, institutions aren't going to work if the people aren't right. Uh, You know, the people aren't going to get the reinforcement they need to be right without the right institutions, right? And you've got a little bit of a chicken and egg problem, but I do believe they sincerely understand uh, that both is the right answer. You mentioned Brett Weinstein. How, how do you think this game B compares and contrasts to uh, the intellectual dark web? I don't think they're, com- they're they're kind of incomparable, incommensurate, right? They they are compatible, uh, but they don't cover really the the, you know, the same space. I think of the intellectual dark web as essentially fighting against stifling political correctness in serious discourse that that is really the, uh, the core purpose and uh, binding energy of the intellectual dark web. And we think that's important in Game B, but, it, uh, but there's much more to Game B than uh, mere good faith discourse. And, you know, got to have it, but that, that's just a prerequisite. And, you know, if you look at you know, people involved in, you know, the intellectual dark web, it's from, you know, raving loony maniacs, left wing, right wing, crazies, very middle of the road people. Uh, so I think it's an approach, uh, you know, a relatively narrow but important approach, which is intellectual honesty, uh, irrespective of what the fuck, uh, you know, the woke crowd thinks, right? Uh, and I support that. But I would say it's, uh, you know, pretty, it's, it, it touches game B, but it, it's nothing really like game B. And, and they might say that, uh, or one of them might say that that's sort of the meta issue that if, if you don't have intellectual honesty or the you know freedom to express your views, then figuring out a lot of these problems will be very difficult. Absolutely. In fact, I'm working on a medium essay that says that right now, right? Uh, it's worth tolerating assholes like neo-Nazis and ISIS to be able to have their say, as long as uh, Jordan Hall and Daniel Schmottenberger can also have their say, right? Because yeah. the truth is, if Game B were to get some momentum, the status quo would be fucking terrified, right? And they try to squelch it. So, uh, you know, we should tolerate uh, free expression uh, as long as people don't advocate violence or advocate illegal stuff uh, to an amazing degree. You know, this I'm really fucking pissed off at uh, this emergence of the desire to censor everybody. Uh, you know, I think, we, I think we used to have a, a consensus in the United States that uh, as long as you're not threatening violence, threatening people, doxing or whatever, uh, you can say the most horrible things. You want to advocate cannibalism? Go right ahead, right? But now there's this idea that we got to stifle bad ideas. Well, you know, a lot of those ideas are bad. You know, I fucking hate Nazis, you know. Anti-vaxxers, I loathe the motherfuckers, right? Uh, you know, and I'm happy to argue with them till the cows come home. On the other hand, I don't want our public speech platforms 
saying, oh, you can't say anything, you, you can't be a you know, bald-faced Nazi or a bald-faced anti-vaxxer, right? Instead, I'd like to see, and this is what I'm putting in my Medium article, uh, behavioral standards. Uh, you can't advocate violence against any person or any group, uh, right? You can't uh, argue. I, I would also go a little further and, and uh, pick up on Karl Popper's uh, paradox of tolerance and say that uh, at some limit, uh, you can't advocate eliminating freedom, right? Uh, at some point, we're not going to allow that. Now, of course, it's going to be pretty hard to be a, a, an honest Nazi and not say you want to kill people, and eliminate freedom. But that's all right. If you can figure out a way to be, an, uh, be a Nazi and not advocate violence or taking away people's freedom, have at it. You, know, you want to have fucking swastikas? I don't care. You're an ass clown uh, by definition. Uh, but you should have the right to your say so long as you don't violate uh, you know, behavioral norms. And that's what I'm going to argue is what should be what the platforms are doing, uh, not picking and choosing, you know, the current uh, favorite or unfavorite, uh, you know, content based suppression of the day. And, yeah. you know, uh, one of Jordan's essays got suppressed by medium. Amazingly. I don't know if you saw that brouhaha. Yeah. But yeah. What the fuck? I mean, uh, you know, this was truthfully, I disagree with Jordan about it. QAnon, I think it's an example of a schizophrenic, insane collective intelligence network. But maybe we don't disagree, but you know, he has a different perspective on it. Uh, but I don't think it was, you know, I, 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 but absolutely without a doubt, that was a good faith and intellectually deep attempt to explore the phenomenon and put it in the, you know, in, in the context of distributed collective intelligence networks and that medium should censor that. And then even when Jordan appealed it, turned the appeal down yeah. is an exemplary to me of what could happen if we let these fuck faces be arbitrarily allowed to suppress things based on content rather than behavior. Yep. Let me let me ask you something. Uh, the where, where does Game B go from here? Like, how does it manifest? What do you predict? What needs to happen? Uh, you know, I don't know. I um, mean, I think that's one of the things about Game B. It is by definition emergent, network based, uh, peer based, uh, and it'll be what it'll be. Uh, I'm actually looking forward to see what it'll be here now. This new energy has suddenly showed up, and uh, in fact, I can announce because I'm going to make it official here later this afternoon, uh, Jordan Hall has agreed to be uh, the admin on the Game B Facebook group. Awesome. Uh, you know, he has, you know, till recently not been willing to, uh, you know, take such a, a forward role. But uh, uh, I'm supposed to be on a Facebook sabbatical anyway, but I haven't been a, such a good boy late. And uh, so I've been pointing two new admins, one of whom is Jordan. And uh, I think that maybe something interesting will come out of this, uh, kind of this interesting now cross wiring between the Twitter uh, Game B world, who frankly Jordan and I didn't even know about them, right? Uh, they just somehow existed out there, and they've now sort of discovered us. Uh, and now some of them are showing up in the Game B Facebook world. Some of the Game B Facebook world people are going over to Twitter, uh, and of course the uh, San Diego group still working away. So I think it's still very much a work in progress, and. I think we'll see. Uh, we'll see some interesting things come up over the next, you know, uh, couple of years. I do think that we need to have an instantiation at some point. And we also, I would, and people argue about this. It's funny on the Twitter group, uh, they're arguing about it. I think I threw out, you know, I've been, I've been telling Jordan for a year, you ought to write a manifesto, right? And people, oh, manifesto, horrible. Again, maybe it's like political party to a millennial. Manifesto sounds like, you know, cat shit on a cracker. I don't know. Uh, but, uh, you know, I would like there to be some meat on the bones of, uh, uh, of what Game B is. But what I like doesn't control. Fuck it, right? Uh, you know, if people want to write a manifesto, they'll write a manifesto. Three different manifestos get written. Great, right? If nobody writes one, BFD, right? Uh, so I think we're at a moment where uh, Game B could form itself up in all kinds of ways. And I don't really know what will happen. Yeah. But it'll be fun. It's interesting to think about what, what is the role of leaders in a sort of peer-driven movement. Yeah, very interesting. And this is something I, we learned uh, from that Game B world. Uh, Jordan and I, well, we were clearly the leaders, uh, for a series of cultural reasons, decided to absolutely eschew the title, right? Uh, and in retrospect, I sort of think that was a mistake. Uh, or something. At least what we did wasn't right. And 
you know, trying to say there is no organization other than pure emergence from a pure peer-based sort is naive. Humans don't work that way, right? You know, we look back at chimps. Chimps don't work that way, right? Uh, now, I will say that, you know, classic uh, org chart top-down is anathema to Game B. Uh, but, you know, one of, the things, one of the things Game B has to invent, and uh, this guy, Forrest Landry, he's, you know, less well-known than Jordan and uh, Daniel. Uh, he's been working on some extraordinarily interesting ideas about how structure is created uh, temporarily, uh, given considerable power, but subject to a veto at any time by the uh, by the community uh, and ways to develop position and authority that comes and goes. But at the end of the day is, uh, you know, under the uh, control of the populace. Uh, I've also done some work for other reasons, mostly having to do with cryptocurrency, but I then realized they also had some applicability to our political operating system. And I've done a lot of work on something called liquid democracy. Uh, I've written, uh, I don't know how many essays now, three, I think. But the one of them is really a good introduction. It's called liquid De- uh, Introduction to Liquid Democracy on Medium. If you type in Introduction to Liquid Democracy, Jim Rutt, it'll pop up. Uh, and the idea of liquid democracy uh, is we get rid of elected officials. And instead, uh, everybody, in theory, can vote on every issue in something like a virtual legislature. And you go, hey, that doesn't seem too practical. And guess what? It ain't. But what makes it practical is that you can proxy your uh, vote to other people, presumably people more knowledgeable than you, and they can reproxy to people more knowledgeable than them. And if this were to work correctly, uh, you'd end up with votes concentrated to people who are both knowledgeable and representing points of view that could then work out what the actual solutions would be. Uh, In my own version of uh, liquid democracy, and by the way, I did not invent liquid democracy. Some people think I did. I did not. Uh, It's been floating around. Some guys in Germany, I think, invented it associated with the Pirate Party. Uh, But I've added some uh, twists to it. For instance, in my version, uh, you'd have multiple proxies, uh, maybe 25 or 30, that might represent the equivalent of the cabinet-level offices of the U.S. government. So education, defense, environment, uh, law and order, uh, health care, et cetera. And you'd have a separate proxy for each one of those. So you could give, uh, you know, your education proxy to your beloved fourth grade teacher, right? Uh, give your edu- uh, edu- uh, your uh, health care proxy to your doctor. You know, give your defense proxy to your uncle who's a retired colonel in the Air Force, right? And, uh, and see how that works, right? Uh, but the other cool thing about liquid democracy is you can retrieve your, uh, your proxy at any time. You decide your uncle, uh, who's the retired Air Force colonel, way too hawkish, right? He's voting for bombing the shit out of people all the time for no good reason. Take that proxy away and uh, give it to Noam Chomsky, right? Or even if you want to, even on a very specific issue, you personally can pull the proxy back and say, I'm going to personally vote on whether we should you know, go to war in Iran or not. I'm not going to let anybody have my vote for that one issue. And I'm thinking things like liquid democracy could be part of what helps Game B actually coalesce. Um, and, I, and I will warn people, uh, I think liquid democracy is a great idea, but it needs to be tried. Uh, you know, there's a whole lot of sociology about it that we don't know what would happen. I would be loath to try it at the nation, at least at the big nation state level anytime soon. Uh, I'd like to see it tried in cities, counties, uh, maybe a small country like Iceland, the population 300,000, maybe Ireland someday, uh, and then work your way up. If it works, great. If it doesn't, Oh, well. Um, so anyway, but I do think that governance modalities need to be experimented with. And this is where uh, Game B can learn from the what's going on in the blockchain world. A huge amount of work going on on things called DAOs, uh, Distributed Autonomous Organization. Now, a lot of it's crazy shit, right? Uh, and again, a lot of it driven by Ayn Rand, hyper libertarian fucking human haters, in my opinion. But on the other hand, there's a lot of good work being done by good people uh, that can be uh, used in building a social operating system. Uh, and I would uh, you know, you know, encourage there to be even more. You know, there's a little bridge there today. Uh, but I'd like to see more of a bridge built between the Game B community and the, uh, the, the various interesting governance and signaling uh, modalities being developed in the uh, in the area of uh, blockchain, public ledger, 
smart contracts and distributed autonomous organizations. And I think that would be a very important set of ingredients uh, for you know, looking, looking for how you really put some meat on the bones of game B. And, and, and to that effect, and we've uh, we've left a lot of breadcrumbs in this episode. I'm excited over the next hour or so to to dig deeper on them. If if, if uh, Jordan said, "Hey, uh, Jim, why don't you take the first stab at what the manifesto should be for Game B?" I'm curious how that would differ uh, from the the one you wrote in 2012 or 2013. If there's anything you'd add or edit or, or change or based on what's uh, it'd be very different. Uh, and frankly, I'm not the right guy to di- uh, to to write it. Uh, you know, if we talked about the fissures in game B, let me put my cards on the table, right? Um, I was, and to a de- solid degree, still am an institutionalist. And on the woo, woo, woo versus scientific realist, I'm uh, God's own scientific realist, uh, uh, you know, to, to coin a gross contradiction, right? Those are probably not the right polarities for where game B is today. And here I'm going to put a, I'm going to make a confession. I was actually thinking about whether I should say this or not. I'm going to say, I'm going to say this anyway, right? I may not actually be a game B personality, right? Uh, it may be that I will be a helper and advisor to game B, but I may be too much of a crusty alpha boomer to really be a good game B person, right? Uh, I don't have the kind of toleration for a bunch of consensus horseshit, right? Uh, you know, and uh, woo woo stuff. I mean, the word uh, spiritual spirituality makes me want to reach for my pistol. Uh, now, I know uh, Jordan has done some good work recently in redefining spirituality uh, in a way that uh, shouldn't cause me to reach for my pistol, but it still causes me to reach for my pistol because it has the goddamn word spirit in it, right? And uh, I wish they would get rid of that word entirely because uh, you know, I am a sworn enemy of uh, metaphysical horseshit. Uh, and, uh, uh, when you start to veer in that direction, I just think bad things come from it. So for all those reasons, I'm probably not the right guy to write the game B, uh, manifesto. Uh, and, uh, I, but I do look forward to see who does write it. And I'm happy to be an advisor. And I will say that there are some documents floating around, which I've done some edits on. Uh, and uh, on the other hand, uh, they're light edits and, uh, and by no means trying to, uh, uh, say that uh, my view of the world's the right one. As I said, my confession, I may not be a game B person. I may be a game B fanboy, right? Yeah. Uh, who's, you know, too set in his ways and, uh, and, uh, you know, and maybe just too goddamn old, uh, to be a real game B person. And yeah. besides, I like who I am. You know, I ain't got change. Fuck that, right? <laughs> 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 Definitely. And you're, if you're the steel man, the, uh, when you said Jordan has done a good job redefining spirituality, how, how do you sort of summarize his contribution or, or how he defines it? I, mean, I haven't looked at it as hard as I could, but my quick take is that he is essentially defining a spirituality, the S word. I'll, I'll just, I can't even say the goddamn word without, <laughs> you know, want, going, you know, hate that word. Uh, hate that fucking word. Uh, that what he's developing is interesting, something not too different from the earliest Buddhism of the Buddha, the oldest Pali canon Buddhism before it got accrusted with metaphysical horseshit. You know, the oldest, purest Buddhism is essentially a toolkit for manipulating uh, what we might now call our brain or our consciousness or consciousness is only a small part of the brain, but what we learn from uh, cognitive science and cognitive neuroscience, managing all that shit to make us more productive people uh, is what I think Jordan is getting at with the S word, with his new definitions of the S word. And I certainly hope so. Uh, I just wish he'd brand it differently. Uh, you know, call it brain tools, right? You know, brain, brain tools for effective people. What the hell's wrong with that? Right. But uh, that's what I think he's doing. Uh, but I wouldn't swear to. And in you, 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 in, you said in 2013, you, you started focusing on, on cognitive science. And I, I think you're doing some research into consciousness, too. Where are you most interested there? Where, what can we learn from your interest there? Or what do you wish more people knew about cognitive science or, or consciousness? Uh, well, one, I think uh, the work I've been doing uh, has convinced me that sort of the pop psychology is right. You know, most of the time it's wrong, but in this case, it is right that our conscious mind is only a teeny part of our mind, right? It's very important and does some things that no other part of the mind can do. But most of the neurons that are firing are not firing in support of our consciousness. They're 
in vision. They're in auditory. They're in keeping our memories alive. They're in consolidating memories. They're in forgetting. They're in uh, all kinds of stuff. And the, uh, uh, the conscious cognition is a specific uh, functional component, which is absolutely important. So that's the pop culture version. On the other side, I take a strong view about what consciousness is. Uh, and I would say I'm a John uh, Searlean, John Searles, a, a philosopher from Berkeley. Uh, you know, his argument is that consciousness is a biological phenomenon that serves a purpose. Uh, and as I've learned more about the uh, neural correlates of consciousness, etc., I've come to the conclusion that consciousness is both genetically and energetically expensive. You know, while I say most of the brain isn't consciousness, maybe 15 or 20 percent of the brain is consciousness. And that's a lot. Right. And the, the genes to encode that is a lot. And uh, Mother Nature would not have preserved this consciousness thing if it wasn't damn useful. Now, also been doing more and more research on the history of consciousness. I'm now coming around to the view uh, that consciousness has probably existed at least from the days of the lizards. Right. Uh, and maybe before that, in fact, I read a very interesting book here. Let me pull up the title. Uh, the Ancient Origins of Consciousness, How the Brain Created Experience by Todd Feinberg and John, J-O-N, Mallett, M-A-L-L-A-T-T. This book uh, does a great job of articulating the history of consciousness, taking an explicitly Cerulean, and this is a brand new book, uh, Cerulean uh, perspective on uh, consciousness and, uh, you know, explains what consciousness is for, right? And I think that's hugely important. Uh, I would also say that uh, along with that is finally we know enough to say, God damn it, Rut was, Rut was right. All this woo-woo horse shit about consciousness, fuck all that. It's not necessary at all, right? There's nothing magical here. Chalmers' hard problem isn't actually hard. Uh, not that I know the answer to it, but uh, it seems obvious to me that we un- that when we understand functionally how conscious cognition works as a biological system that has real work to do uh, to preserve the life and, and enhance the reproduction of animals, starting with at least reptiles and maybe earlier, it'll all become obvious. And we won't need any damn woo about uh, consciousness. Uh, so that's that's some of my biggest takeaways. And what are the implications of the uh, of the pop culture view that it's only a small percentage of what's going on in a brain? Like, why does that matter? Uh, why does that matter? I'm not sure it does. I think, it pra- you know, but it, it's interesting that it actually confirmed the pop culture. Uh, probably more importantly is that consciousness is not epiphenomenal, right? It is there for a purpose. Uh, and uh, what it, in my particular model Consciousness provides a series of conscious contents uh, following Bernard Barr's global workspace model. And uh, probably more uh, strongly than most, I argue that uh, we then have the cursor of, of attention that jumps from one conscious content to another. And what we think of as consciousness is really mostly just the motion of this cursor of consciousness that can move about once every 250 milliseconds. It doesn't always move. Often it doesn't. Decides to stay on the same object. Uh, but literally, that is the, the playground of consciousness. And when each item comes into attention, that sends a whole bunch of signals from that object to memory, in fact, the various memories we have. And then they signal back up to the mechanism that chooses the next item of attention. Uh, then uh, there's a, a side mechanism which fires a affordance or something you can do with an object, right? And initially, those are kind of hard to do, like learning to ride a bicycle. Uh, but when you're like riding, driving a car, if you know how to drive a car, the affordance of being in your car is you can say, okay, brain, call the program for drive my car. And that's actually an unconscious or damn close to unconscious program with some exits uh, to consciousness. And so understanding how that architecture works does a lot of things, you know, one, it teaches us how to learn better, right? Uh, you know, it teaches us that, again, some of the, you know, things we've heard from our teachers are indeed right. It's probably best not to jam for eight solid hours. You probably ought to get up every two or three hours and go take a break to allow some, some con- consolidation. Uh, you should also not be mad at yourself if you're bad at something when you're first starting it, because uh, initially you are forcing uh, your brain by horribly inefficient conscious cognition to do its thing, right? And the brain doesn't really want to, like, say, learn how to take a bicycle apart for the first time. 
uh, and fix the, uh, uh, the shifters, right? Uh, those of us ridden bikes have all done that. And the first time is a fucking nightmare of uh, obscure horse shit, right? Uh, but then you've done it six times. You can do it with your eyes closed. Well, not quite your eyes closed, but you can do it while you're talking to your buddy. I mean, you've done it 20 times, you can do it with your eyes closed, right? And uh, we should just understand that that is how we learn. And we should, uh, uh, I wish that more of this uh, conscious cognitive science, cognitive neuroscience was incorporated into the education departments that teach our teachers. But unfortunately, they're 40 or 50 years behind. Uh, it's sad, actually. We could be doing way better jobs with education if we took what we knew about how the brain actually worked and and uh, and did, did apply things with it. And I do believe that Game B is going to do that. Game B has in its charter a new kind of education. And I would hope that they would be focused. I haven't really heard anything about it yet, but I would hope that uh, uh, whoever's going to be cooking up or groups of people cooking up game B education, make sure they saturate themselves uh, in uh, current state of the art knowledge about cognitive science uh, and cognitive neuroscience. And are there any other things that would be different if, if they you know, fully understood that in terms of what, what else would be in that education charter? Just in the education charter. Uh, or I guess, if, yeah. How would education be different if we fully understood you know, cognitive it would be completely different, to tell you the truth. I very much doubt it would be sausage factories, right, that, uh, you know, kids uh, trape into, like, uh, little workers every morning and hop to and the bell rings, all that work. I expect it would be extremely different. I don't think people would go to school all the time. I think it would be a lot more apprenticeship, uh, a lot more in the community. You might even see the return of uh, the old community schoolhouse with kids of different ages who teach each other. Uh, I think – it would be nothing like the current public school model. Totally. What, what are the other pillars of, of game P char, game B charter in general, as, as you understand it, so if education is one of them, what are the other ones? Economics for sure. Uh, and this one, I can definitely refer to somebody uh, to people to a place of some good thinking. Uh, Daniel Schmattenberger has written four essays uh, called the new economic series one to four on his blog, civilizationemerging.com. Uh, these things are great. And they don't answer it, but they uh, paint a lot of picture about what it needs to be, uh, to be something that won't uh, you know, revert to this race to death that our current cycle is in. And then, you know, and I, Daniel and I have talked about this a lot, but you'll love this. I think we've spoken for like four hours about one paragraph that uh, this is how deep this stuff is. Uh, so I would say if you want to see a wonderful exemplar of economic thinking, which may or may not be right, but it's a damn good exemplar, uh, go look there. Yeah. And uh, obviously you have a lot of overlap with those folks. Where are your biggest uh, disagreements with uh, with Daniel and Jordan? Uh, some of them are tactical about the nature of, of economics. For instance, uh, Daniel believes that the new economics must not involve trade-offs, that every move must make everybody better off. And I say, bullshit, right? Uh, competition is natural and normal, right? And one of the examples I give is, imagine a town big enough to support one plumber. And let's say this plumber is both expensive and piss poor, right? Not a good plumber and charges a lot. Uh, a new person shows up in town or just be traipsing by and happens to be a good plumber. And here's a, hmm, this town's got a expensive and incompetent plumber. And so they come to town and they say, hey, I'm happy to do plumbing at 75% of what the schmo uh, uh, charges. And I'll return your call within 15 minutes and I do a good job, right? And very quickly, one would hope, a uh, good plumber drives bad plumber out of town, right? Out of business. Now that's a trade-off. Uh, bad plumber just lost his job and he and his kids got to go find something new to do. Uh, and new plumber uh, has benefited. And the system as a whole, I would argue, has benefited. So uh, it seems to me the idea that you can eliminate trade-offs is unrealistic. I mean, that's good. Something what, to argue about, but uh, there's an example. What do, you, what do you think of his assertion or his analogy that maybe our economic system needs to sort of mirror how cells work in the human body? It's neither capitalism nor socialism, and maybe one of the implications there are uh, that we should get rid of private property. He spoke I think about that's that. uh, well worth considering. Uh, you know, he knows uh, that... You know, I've been a long time uh, proponent of the market, uh, and he was actually a little bit afraid. Uh, I think he thought that I would be, you know, have a reflexive reaction against that idea. He, he tiptoed up to it very carefully. He said, oh, no, lay it out, Daniel. Uh, I'm perfectly willing to consider that. Uh, and I think it should be considered. 
And whether that means eliminating every single bit of private property or, uh, you know, on one end, maybe a, 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 at a, a moderate level is make all real estate uh, common wheel. I think there's a really good argument for that. Uh, and, and there may be other things that, uh, that should not be private property. So I think that's an idea well worth exploring. I think you should not say no to that idea, uh, but it needs a lot more work on how you do it and whether it's right and uh, does it produce a society that we think is good and fair and congruent with human nature. Uh, you know, I'll put that card on the table too. I do believe there is something called human nature. Now, on the other hand, it's way more flexible than some of these uh, you know, people who try to have a narrow human nature. You look at anthropology, and there's amazingly weird shit that humans have done to organize their society. But at the end of the day, there are some, you know, sort of fundamentals that seem to appear in every society. So, uh, and, and game what, what, is, what is the theory of, of human nature and, and what societies tend to be more congruent with it? There's a book uh, called Human Universals by a guy named Donald Brown. Damn hard to find. The last time I saw, they won 500 bucks for it used on Amazon. And he lays out hundreds of them. Uh, but, you know, for instance, uh, parents are going to care about their children, right? There's not a, at least the mother will care about their children in societies where uh, sometimes the father doesn't even know he's the father, right? But mothers will care about their children. Attempts to work around that never work. Israeli kibbutz in the early days, one of their ideological things was, Children should be raised, taken from their parents, raised in a, together in a peer group, and go visit their parents on Sunday afternoon for two hours. But uh, we should surely try to break down the relationship between the parent and the child because all it does is replicate bad patterns from previous generations. Well, that didn't work at all, right? In Israel today, on even the most severe kibbutz, it's still a nuclear family unit, and everybody's much happier with that. Uh, so so there, is, uh, there is an example. Uh, another uh, example is that there is in every known society a strong libido to punish cheaters, right? And there's actually even what's called second order policing, which is a strong libido to punish people who won't punish uh, cheaters, right? And uh, sometimes, unfortunately, this can be co-opted for quasi-fascistic purposes. Uh, but on the other hand, it's almost certainly a necessary attribute of a coherent society that isn't parasitized by game theoretical problems like free riders, right? Uh, At the Santa Fe Institute, Jessica Flack has done a lot of very interesting work on policing in the most general sense. And police doesn't mean a dude in a blue suit with a nightstick, but it means a mechanism to cause sanctions against people who break the covenant, who break uh, uh, the the, the group norms in such a way as to uh, produce harm for others and benefit for themselves. So those are two that, you know, stand out uh, very clearly. And, you know, so, you know, again, the, uh, the, uh, some of the more hippie types, say, Oh, police, that's horrible. Go, well, yeah, I mean, you know, you got to have policing. You don't have to necessarily be cops, but if you don't have policing. I tar- guarantee your society is going to go to shit. Right. Uh, if you went to any of those occupy sites, uh, and we did, I went to some of them. Uh, they literally went to shit, shit in the bushes, you know, shit on the ground, shit on the sidewalk. Uh, you know, they were afraid of policing. They didn't want to be fascists. Well, you know, you don't have to be a fascist and still have policing. Uh, so human nature says you got to have policing in some fashion. Uh, so those are just two. And there's a bunch of others. Yeah. To education, uh, economics, uh, any other uh, elements of the charter that, that are worth discussing? Uh, a huge one is conviviality. And I think this is the one that is closest to Jordan's heart at the moment. I think. I'm not sure. I haven't talked about it explicitly. I'll that, talk to him about it. Uh, but it's something he and I have talked about as part of our dialogue for how many years now? 11 years. Is that the, one of the worst things about our current society is the breakdown of rich, multimodal, face-to-face society, Right. Uh, nothing pisses me off worse than to walk into a bar and see four millennials sitting around a, uh, a table with beers in front of them, all on their fucking little phones, right? Uh, I just want to go up to them and smack them upside the head. Say, hey, that's why I'm not exactly a Game Beats personality, right? Now, to the degree I might be is I don't actually do it, right? Uh, but my good old redneck self wants to go, boom, asshole, you shouldn't be out here in a bar with your friends, all of you fucking texting people. Right. Uh, conviviality, how to be in the moment with other people, uh, how to have an 
everyday society so that every day, many hours are spent in enjoyable interaction face-to-face with other people who you hold in esteem and who you respect and who you love. And I think that is, if we get that to work, that's going to attract people so strongly uh, that the rest of the stuff will be worked out, it will be, uh, be easier to work out. Because I believe that people don't know it, but they are starved for authentic conviviality. So going, going back to your, if, if you wrote, maybe not the Game B Manifesto, but if you edited your manifesto that you wrote in 2012, 2013, what, what would be uh, different or added or, or changed based on either what's happened in the world slash what you've, uh, what you've learned along the way? I'm going to get it. Hard. Not, as I said, not even commensurable, uh, truthfully. I mean, that thing was aiming towards, especially the version I sent you, uh, which was the third edition, which was uh, rewritten substantially after the Emancipation Party was birthed. And so it was really sort of a, a deep background on what a political ideology in the form of a, of a party might look like. And that's not what Game B is going to be. So it would be structurally, emotionally, every and every process-wise, very different. So I w- again, I wouldn't attempt to, you know, be trying to, you know, you know, turn a helicopter into a donkey or something. It just makes yeah. no sense, right? Yeah, but, but even game, game B aside, and we'll get to some of the specific tenets in, in that manifesto. Have any of them you you radically changed your mind on from the, from or or have played out in different ways that have said, oh, if I was trying to make a new political party today, or if I was just editing those ideas, they'd be different. Yeah, one thing I would do is I would bring the uh, game B flavor to them much more. Uh, I would pay more attention to uh, non-hierarchical, peer-based um, governance. Uh, you know, we didn't really go into that in that original document in any great degree. Uh, you know, for instance, you know, in the new monetary system, there's a, a thing called the book interest rate, which is key to how it works. Uh, if I were thinking about that today, I would spend a shitload of time deciding how is that set, Right. I think I just naively said, oh, we'll use the Friedman rule, right? Okay, well, who determines, right? How are exceptions done? I would spend much more time thinking about the en- the engines of governance, things like liquid democracy, things like uh, distributed autonomous organizations, and, and pay much more attention to that rather than the substance of policy, in addition to the substance of policy. I think the, I do think that the substances are important and mostly right, but... Uh, but I would, but it, it needs a lot more work on how can this be governed in a way that's non-capturable by bad actors uh, and is perceived by most to be in their interest and fair and transparently so. Uh, you know, another way you referred to the uh, game B is uh, the search for the fifth attractor. Can, can you talk a little bit about the, the main idea behind yeah. that? Uh, the idea of uh, in search of the fifth attractor, another essay by me, uh, type in fifth attractor Jim Rutt into Google and you'll find it on Medium. And I will warn you, it's uh, about five years old and even worse. It's mostly a transcription of a talk I gave a year or two before that. So it doesn't represent state of the art version of my thinking, but still pretty good. So the idea is the following, that a social operating system uh, is a basin of attraction, as we would call it in complexity science. Think of it as a series of bindings between uh, culture, society, media, finance, you know, everything that constitutes our society, and it is a bowl. And imagine the exact current state of, the, of our society is a marble in that bowl, right? And things are always jiggling around, the marble's moving around in the bowl. And from time to time, big shocks happen, either exogenous shocks, you know, oh, shit, you know, a meteor, big meteorite hit or a huge electrical storm took down the grid, uh, it caused all kinds of weird shit to happen inside the bowl uh, or endogenous things happens. You know, suppose we have a financial collapse way bigger than the last one, right? Uh, suppose the U.S. and China get into a nuclear war over Taiwan, right? Uh, you know, this bowl suddenly starts shaking and enough shaking happens in the marble, which is the current state of our society in a high dimensional space, goes flying out of the bowl. Uh, I should also add in this bowl uh, metaphor that the bowl sides can come down. And I would argue that our depletion of the ecosystem constitutes uh, a reduction of the sides of the bowl. Uh, You know, it's it's kind of scary that the mass of humans plus our domestic animals is now way greater than the mass of all other mammals on Earth put together. 
And that's in an era where only 18% of humanity is living in the OECD advanced countries. Uh, if everybody else demands a middle-class lifestyle, we're fucked, right? At least within the current uh, paradigm. Uh, you know, the, uh, what's another way, another way that the uh, bowl sides come down is suppose it turns out, and I'll talk later about this, I'm not sure that it will, but suppose social networks, uh, social media turns out to have poisoned our ability to think right? Uh, that The world is so full of fake news, bad faith discourse, and horseshit uh, that we l- literally stop being able to make good decisions as a polity. That is part of lowering the sides of the bowl and by itself alone could cause the marble to fly out. So we have game A, let's just call it game A, bowl, marble flopping around, moving around, shit's always changing. Uh, but a big shock happens, endogenous, i.e. interior, exogenous, some combination too, ball goes flying out. Where does it land? Well, uh, in a higher dimensional space, one could think of a whole series of dimples on a rubber sheet where the marble might land or a whole bunch of bowls laying around. They're at the bottom of dimples on a rubber sheet. The bowl would bounce around for a while, but eventually would fall into them. So when I identified what pre-existing attractors are out there, I came out with came up with four, and I don't like any of them. So let me review what, what I call the four bad attractors are. Uh, number one, and it's interesting that I wrote this 12, in 2012, or maybe this was 14, whatever, but before China was quite the big deal it is now. Uh, the first is neo-fascism. And I argue that China is actually neo-fascist, even though it call, still calls itself Marxist-Leninist, but it's uh, authoritarian, militaristic, nationalistic, dictatorial, you know, controls media. It's fucking fascist, right? Uh, and you know, it sort of works, right? At least so far. And it presents a possible alternative. Should the West, you know, lose faith in itself, where might it go? You know, it could fall into neo-fascism. We have weaker versions of it with uh, Putin uh, as an example, and uh, maybe uh, uh, possible emergent ones in places like Hungary. Uh, But let's call China the great example of uh, uh, neo-fascism. Uh, another one, definitely alive, and there are millions, perhaps billions of people in the world, maybe a billion people in the world who would like it, uh, which is neo-dark ages, theocracy, right? And, uh, you know, as a scientific realist, uh, I think all religions horseshit, and so I don't pick and choose amongst them. They go, oh, you're anti islamist Well, yeah, but I'm also anti-Christian, anti-Jew, anti-Hindu, you know, I hate them all, right? Uh, but anyway, uh, there are fanatics in all those religions that would love to have a theocracy. And one could see in an extreme event uh, that our society fall into a theocracy. And we saw what happened when, in the last time that happened. Uh, we basically lost a thousand years of uh, progress. Uh, and that could happen again. Um, I'm reading a book right now about the history of technology that dwells quite a lot on what happened and what didn't happen during the Middle Ages. The third one is uh, neo-feudalism. And that's my name for uh, hyper-libertarianism, uh, hyper-libertarianism connected with hyper-finance and network effects, right? And what I would argue is that a very small number of people, even smaller number than today, essentially own everything, uh, force everybody else to the to the edge of existence. Uh, they have a small cadre of knights, maybe 10% of people, to enforce their will on the 90% of serfs. And, you know, Peter Thiel sitting there at the top, lording it over everybody. Right. Uh, And so I think that's a possibility, particularly after a period of chaos, Uh, because, you know, these transitions aren't necessarily directly from one to the other. The marble may wander around for a while before it falls in. So we might go into the the fourth one, which is chaos first, uh, where it all just breaks down. Right. And that's happened from time to time. It's happened in China plenty of times. Uh, A fair amount of it happened in Russia after the fall of the Soviet Union. It didn't fall to all the way, but it fell fair ways to chaos. And for at least a few months, none of the entities that were supposed to do things did anything, right? Uh, when you called the fire department, nobody came, right? Uh, and so let's say a bigger fall into chaos. Uh, my prediction is uh, not some form of stable anarchy, uh, but might maybe, hey, David Graeber, you know, convince me I'm wrong. But uh, more likely, first uh, criminal gangs, uh, then warlords, then dictators, right? Uh, and then maybe neo-feudalism uh, controlled by money. So those are the four attractors. Uh, neo-fascism, 
uh, neo dark ages, neo feudalism, hyper libertarianism, and chaos. Uh, and I go, I don't like any of those. God damn it! Uh, and so, therefore, our duty as enlightened people is to build the fifth attractor. That's why I tend to use this phrase in search of the fifth attractor. Uh, of course, that's totally arbitrary. There's a lot more than four bad attractors and there's more than one good attractor. But just to keep it simple, I call it in search of the fifth attractor. And that, I think, loosely speaking, could be gain B. Doesn't have to be, by the way. Maybe somebody else builds another better attractor. And, um, and my model of the fifth attractor allows for that. It just says somebody needs to build a better attractor so that when the marble flies out of the bowl, it has a place to land uh, that, ha- that produces a society. And this is a Jordan Jimism. I forgot about this Jordan Jimism. I like this one, which is, uh, and other and other people contribute to this as well. Uh, when we're coming up with this as a motto for the late EP, I think, with Emancipation Party, which is we would like to create a society in which we are uh, uh, happy to live in and proud to leave to our children. Right. If it's game B, great. And I think game B has a you know real chance to be that. But somebody else could come up with the fifth attractor. And I would just say generically, we need a fifth attractor that it, it has some work done on it. So it is ready to go at need. And where does sort of democratic neoliberalism fall, fall into into this? Is it one of the four or is it? Now, I would say that in the collapse scenario, it fails, goes away. On the other hand, uh, I have not given up all hope for democratic liberalism. Now, neoliberalism, I do believe, is done. Put a fork in it, right? It's internal contradictions are such uh, in terms of ever-growing wealth inequality, uh, in terms of, you know, these things we were just talking about earlier about the platform companies trying to suppress discourse. That is part of neoliberalism. Uh, I think neoliberalism is done. I hope it is. Uh, But a reformed enlightenment liberalism that, allows the marble not to fire out of the bowl could still happen. Uh, not very optimistic about it, particularly over the last couple of years is, uh, you know, the whole world seems to have gone nuts, but that's, that's still a decent, that's still a, an acceptable path for people to work on. Uh, but truthfully, I would put it as a minority trajectory versus uh, the marble flying out of the bowl sometime between tomorrow afternoon and the year 2100. Totally. And, and uh, to take the religion point for a second, you're, you're, you mentioned your friend Brett Weinstein. He has this view that uh, religion has sometimes sort of a metaphorical truth that uh, is not literally true, but if you believed it, your life is better. I, I think I'm sort of paraphrasing what he describes as the metaphorical truth of, of religions. Do you think that's hogwash? Or I think that's definitely true. Uh, you know, uh, you know, in exactly the same way, uh, a four-year-old believing in Santa Claus makes the four-year-old happier, right? There's no, there's no contradiction between something being utterly false and uh, tactically useful. Uh, I just think it's a bad way to design a social operating system. Yeah. And so what do you, can you describe more what you mean when you say social operating system? Uh, this basin of attraction, you know, game A is a social operating system. It doesn't call itself that. Uh, and it wasn't built by anybody. It evolved, right? And game B will evolve, by the way. No one's going to build game B, right? These things are too complicated to build. Uh, what you can do is kind of garden and nurture them to grow together. And they're highly multidimensional. So, you know, I mentioned it's, a, it's the educational system. It's the culture. It's the signaling systems. Uh, it's the, uh, uh, you know, Marxian analysis. It's the ownership of the means of production. It's what is, do we have uh, private property or not? You know, we're, you know, it's a whole bunch of things. It's the social operating system, everything. You, you, you mentioned that you want to see sort of no more political parties. You wrote, wrote a post about it. You, and you, you said the, uh, the group that you think is, is doing the most interesting stuff is Lawrence Lessig's. What do you think, like, what, what could replace political parties or, or how, would you, how would you reform that if we could? Yeah, now, Lessig, it was in a particular context at a particular time. And I believe Lessig was doing the best good. I don't know what the hell he's doing now. When I wrote that, it was some time back, a couple of years ago. Uh, about getting money out of politics. He had a really well-designed plan, which I think uh, Elizabeth Warren has adopted part of, uh, to get money out of the current political system. So let's put that to one side. That's the fix on the current shit show, which might allow the current shit show to reform itself sufficiently to keep the marble in the bowl. But in terms of my stronger uh, analyses, uh, which led me to liquid democracy, 
or potentially uh, some form of uh, distributed autonomous organization. But I've yet to see one that passes my uh, smell test, but not to say it couldn't have. It seems to me a rather unnatural thing for us to get ourselves ultra agitated about politics and have elections like we do, right? It's not necessary. Uh, you know, go back and, and read that essay and you can see that every decision that's made by political entities could be made in a calm and, and continuous uh, fashion without these cliffs all the time. And these cliffs don't do us any good. They bring out the worst in our nature. Uh, you know, team, a, what I call them, team red and team blue. And when you listen to these people on these social media networks, it, they contradict. You know, there's no ideological consistency, right? I mean, how can you be in favor of free speech? Uh, oh, how can you be uh, yeah, in favor of sp- in free speech and opposed uh, to fr- the right to keep and bear arms, right? Or how can you be? How can you oppose abortion but be in favor of capital punishment? Yeah, you can in some sophistic way get there. But the truth of the matter is, the reason these uh, these bizarre uh, teams form is because they're just teams, right? They're like soccer teams, football teams, team A, team B, team red, team blue. Uh, And they have a a game theoretical ability to attract approximately half the vote. And uh, that is a fucked up way to run a a polity. Uh, Much better to give your, your proxies out to people who believe what you believe and vote on the issues you care about the way you would vote. Uh, if you were to vote yourself. And, and they may be seemingly incoherent from the perspective of Team Red and Team Blue, but it does not mean that you are incoherent. It just means those Team A, those Team Red and Team Blue are incoherent, not you the person. Let's get into some liquid democracy stuff. Does it re- rely on a uh, public that is sort of, you know, epistemologically modest about what they do or do not know? Or, or what, what, what needs to be true for it to be successful? I think it needs only two things. There's a bunch of control systems it needs to avoid fraud. But let's say, let's say at the core, uh, I think uh, you, hit, you hit on one of them, which is a general sense of epistemological modesty. And I'm, I, mean, I know more about more things than 99.99% of people, but I would proxy probably 28 out of my 30 proxies, right? which is I know that I don't know nearly as much as the experts in education and defense and uh, healthcare do. So epistemological modesty and the ability to sense the gradient to people who know more than you do. That's all it is. It's all it takes. It takes those two things. Yeah. Some people are sort of uh, advocating for their utopia is sort of uh, a thousand Singapore's or a thousand Israel's or sort of smaller city state, city states or city countries, you know, run effectively by CEO. Israel's not run by CEO. Singapore was effectively. Um, what do you think about sort of CEO driven countries where you have significantly less voice, but significantly higher exit? And so you could just, you know, companies sort of or cities sort of compete over you the way, you know, Apple and Google sort of compete over you just by making the best. It's the first step to the nightmare of neo-feudalism. Why is that? Because it's, you know, pure money driven, right? And the guys with the money make the rules, right? Pure feudalism. And remember, feudalism was very diffuse. Europe had uh, 5,000 sort of what you'd call legal entities uh, in uh, the year 1000. Yeah, so that's just, uh, that's the, the, the road to neo-feudalism. Right. The, the, pro- the inherent problems with neo-feudalism is just increasing inequality or, or could you, you need feudalism paired with something else. Like what it's is feudalism? It's paired with? Hideous, vile and evil. Uh, and, and, and here's why. Because you can say, oh, yes, you have the right to exit. But that's, you know, theoretical. That's libertarian think. Right. Uh, in reality, people are grounded to a place. They are grounded to their conviviality, to their social network. And those things matter a shitload more than some theoretical right to exit. And so this is an inhumane, inhuman ideology, uh, which should be uh, rejected. Root and branch. Yeah. And in in general, going back to the Ayn Rand and the the return types, what do you think is sort of the the crux of what they fundamentally misunderstand? Maybe maybe they get some things right, but what what do they not fully appreciate? Uh, Just what I just said, that life is more than economics, number one, way more than economics. And in fact, it's way, way more than economics. Uh, in fact, in my uh, fifth attractor essay, I came up with a little metaphor that I liked a lot, and a nifty little graphic, which is, you know, one can think of the market uh, in a good way as a furnace heating your house, right? We've constrained it. 
It has its little place in your house, but your house is much bigger than the furnace. But if we think about hyper unrestrained capitalism, we can think of a fire burning down our house where the fire is the thing and the house is secondary to the fire. Uh, And so I think that's the first biggest mistake that uh, libertarians make. The second, and they all make it, and I made it when I was a libertarian, and I was one, I'll confess, I'll fast to that uh, for many years, is that even if we understand intellectually, we don't understand at the gut level, that humans live on a bell, bell curve on every attribute you can possibly imagine, right? You know, yes, if everybody had the cognitive ability of, uh, had a, you know, the, of the equivalent of 130 IQ and an MBA from fucking Harvard, yeah, let the uh, law of contracts uh, go. I still think we produce a fucked up result, uh, but at least it wouldn't be fundamentally unfair. Today, what we essentially have is IQ 130 people designing uh, fucked up traps to fuck over people with IQs of 90. And I can think of few things that are more immoral than that. You know, the whole banking system, you know, this goddamn overdraft horseshit, which is just sucking money out of people's pockets. Uh, you know, these point systems. It's all smart people designing ways to fuck over dumb people. And there are always going to be dumb people and there's always going to be lots of them. And people, libertarians forget that. And we have to have a society in which everybody, no matter what set of endowments they got, can live a life of dignity, honor, uh, productivity, uh, belonging, and conviviality. They completely forget about that. Yeah. And when people talk about the problems of democracy, you know, public choice, principal agent problem, or just, hey, democracy it seems to be falling out of favor, hasn't you know worked in the Middle East, et cetera. When they talk about those problems of democracy, the problems underlying democracy, does, does liquid democracy get it, get at those? I think it does. You know, a, a bunch of reasons. One, you don't have the, or at least you grossly attenuate uh, the agent's problem, right? Because you can recreate, you can retrieve uh, your proxy at any time. I would expect there to be uh, services that would emerge because all, all votes by everybody and every this whole tree of proxies would be transparent, and so you could get a service for. $2 a year, which would essentially uh, send you weekly how your proxies are doing, right? Oh, this, you know, you, I've said these are sort of what my values are. Maybe this guy used to be there and now he's drifting. Very much like in uh, portfolio management, when you get style drift uh, in a, a portfolio, you know, they claim they're a value stock, but wait a minute, they're larding their portfolio up with growth stocks, right? And if you've ever looked at institutional investment uh, performance reporting, uh, one of the key things you look for is style drift in your fund managers. Uh, And so I could see those kinds of services uh, emerging naturally. Uh, Then the other huge one, and this is maybe the biggest of all, uh, is is the epistemological modesty problem. Uh, Jason Brennan has written a, a very fun book called Against Democracy, a great book, a little bit tongue in cheek, but I think he actually means it. You know, he goes in great details, citing the research, how amazingly stupid uh, in, about political issues your average American is. You know, like a majority of Americans, I believe, or close to a majority, couldn't even tell you whether the Democrats or the Republicans are more conservative, right? It's, it's just amazing, right? Uh, and, but we should just acknowledge that. You know, why should people care about that shit? Right. They want to live their lives. They don't want to you know, be involved in the inside baseball on how some fix in the depreciation uh, allowance has allowed the oil companies to rip off another ten billion dollars. Right. Uh, why the hell would any normal person be interested in that or even being able to know how to evaluate someone who'd be interested in that? Uh, so I think that, uh, you know, the argument against democracy that most people are clueless is actually a good argument. But liquid democracy is, at least in theory, the answer, assuming that some reasonable percentage of people have a decent nose for the gradient for the person that knows more than they do. Right. And what gives you confidence that uh, people who will be clueless will also be modest about their cluelessness? Because people love having opinions about stuff that they know nothing about. <laughs> well, I think with, you know a, a lot of education about some of the things that are in Brennan's book and some of the other books on the topic. And, and, and you know, imagine public school education. If you know, we focus on the fact that uh, this is what people actually know, which ain't much. Uh, and why in the world should they be uh, you know uh, you know electing the guy with his finger on the nuclear trigger? Uh, you know, that doesn't seem very sensible. So we have this new system called liquid democracy, where it's your duty as a citizen to look around you and see who do you trust? Who do you think knows more than you do about these issues? And to, in good faith, give your proxy to people who know more than you do and you believe uh, represent your values. 
So yeah. it would be ed- it's education, uh, culture. You know, it's always those things. Yeah. It's less wisdom of the crowds, more modesty of the crowd. Yeah, uh, and, you know, and the fact that there are people that know more than than as I said, you know, if there were thirty proxies, I guarantee I'd proxy at least twenty eight of them, uh, and maybe all thirty. Uh, and I know more than ninety nine point nine nine percent of Americans about most things, right? Uh, but I still don't know expert level things about a lot of things. I, I want to get into some of your uh, thoughts on thoughts on money, uh, in particular, you know, in the last decade, the last seven years, with the rise of uh, Bitcoin, there's sort of been a rise in uh, in Austrian economics or resurgence, I should say, of Austrian e- economics. And I'm curious where your views on money and and you know the financial system uh, overlap and c- uh, contrast with 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 Austrian economics. Yeah, and I know I'm well 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 familiar with uh, Austrian economics. I sort of think. Uh, uh, how that works. Now, in terms of my dividend money system, which you can find on uh, YouTube, type in Jim Rutt, uh, dividend money. I do propose the, the, the Freeman rule, which is that the money supply grows at the average GDP. And you have to pick a number and say uh, plus two, plus two percent. So you'd say GDP grows at uh, two percent, uh, plus two is four percent. So uh, by law, money supply grows at four percent. Nobody can change that. Now, as I mentioned, I have not given sufficient thought to the governance mechanisms to make sure that would be true, uh, which some of the people in the blockchain world have. Uh, so I do believe that uh, there is uh, some real utility uh, to taking the, uh, the money supply uh, lever away from government. Uh, on the other hand, I don't like giving it to banks. I mean, this is the dirty secret about our current system that if most people most people don't know. And if they did, there'd probably be a revolution tomorrow. 90%, 95% in the UK uh, of the money that comes into circulation is created by banks on their own balance sheets with their pen, right? Uh, all new money, except for a small amount, is in manufactured by commercial banks and then loaned out for interest, right? Why should that be? Uh, wouldn't it be much better to have the new money that we want to keep prices stable come into the economy as a dividend, a social dividend to each citizen pro rata. Uh, you know, by my calculations, uh, a reasonable level of GDP growth and the Friedman rule of, uh, you know, rate plus two, uh, the Rutt Friedman rule of rate plus two, uh, people will get about, uh, what was it, two or three thousand dollars a year, uh, per person, uh, of new money flowing into their account, which would then disseminate out in, into the, uh, into the system to provide uh, demand stimulus. Uh, in two ways. One, it's uh, to the people, so they define what it is, not to the banks. And second, it doesn't require any interest that then becomes a burden on the whole economy uh, to support the money supply. Not to say there was, not to say that I'm opposed to interest. There should still be banking, but it should be what's called 100% reserve banking, right? It's essentially investment pools, right? Uh, I have some money I want to uh, give to a bank to lend out to people. I give them, I literally give them the money, they lend it out at interest. They pay me some lower interest rate. Uh, and there's, uh, you know, a whole bunch of really good work on 100% reserve banking. Uh, a guy's named White at George Mason University. Lawrence H. White. Uh, he goes through a uh, whole series of detailed recipes, how you can do everything that financial services does today that at least isn't fraudulent or pernicious and do it in the uh, 100% reserve banking model. That's where that's that's what the RUT plan calls for. Uh, in terms of the uh, blockchain uh, world, they're very different. But on the other hand, there's so many different approaches. I shouldn't say they're all there. Let's take the first one, Bitcoin. A brilliant bit of math. I mean, I read Satoshi's paper maybe three or four months after it came out, and I go, holy shit. And then further, it was kind of like Darwin. I go, why didn't I think of that? It wasn't that hard, right? Uh, but it was brilliant to have thought of it. And uh, it was like, fuck, right? Uh, however, Bitcoin itself, I think, is very pernicious. Um, it's, you bas- it's basically designed to be like gold. And so it's like gold, but worse, essentially, right? And it only has one. Why is it worse? Ah, uh, because of mining, right? In gold mining, at least sometimes, the gold mines shut down. Uh, in the uh, in uh, Bitcoin, because of the way they re- set, set the level of effort and all this stuff, the mining continues to accelerate the heat death of the universe 
all the time, right? What a ridiculous thing. 5% of the market cap of Bitcoin every year goes up the uh, smokestack in electricity. It's insane, right? Even the U.S. fractional reserve banking system uh, is, uh, you know, a percent or or two at the most. So, you know, Bitcoin is way worse than even our own uh, ineptly uh, designed uh, uh, monetary system. And uh, the other thing is it's terrible in that it's, deflationary, uh, deflationary money supply. Well, again, this is the Randians, the Austrians say, oh, it's just algebra. You can do the, al- you can do the uh, calculations himself. Truth is, humans don't. And uh, Gresham's law is true. And they will hoard money that grows over time. They'll spend money that inflates. And so uh, in the velocity of money will, will collapse in a uh, deflationary money system uh, like Bitcoin. Uh, so those two. Uh, Third, it's the exact opposite of what it ought to be, which is it is uh, potentially uh, anonymous. Uh, And I think money should be the exact opposite. It should be radically transparent. I'd like to see every bank account in the world to be world readable. Wouldn't that be interesting, right? Uh, Maybe have a small amount of vice money that's not not transparent. Uh, But all the big money ought to be transparent. I'd like to literally watch the flow of funds from every single person. Uh, I think you'd have a hell of a lot better society if people, if, if that's what happened. Bitcoin's quite the opposite. And in fact, when I think about the, the, the use cases of Bitcoins, there's only really one good one, which is the collection of ransoms uh, for uh, pernicious computer hacking. It's perfect for that, right? But otherwise, I don't, I don't see a good use case uh, for Bitcoin. It's expensive. It's slow. Uh, it's cumbersome. Uh, it's alien. Uh, it's uh, failure uh, prone in the mode of people losing their private keys, uh, which has been a huge amount of loss of the private keys already, and it will be more over time. It's just a, not useful for any real economic purpose except collecting ransom. What, what, uh, what about a store of value if, if you're in Venezuela or Greece and you don't trust the, trust the currency? Temporarily, it might be, while the greater fools are greater fooling, uh, but uh, I'd rather use gold. A much stronger historical uh, pattern for being a store of value. And uh, what I frankly prefer people do is invest their money in useful, productive assets, right? Uh, buy land, right? You know, you're going to have a store of value in land. Uh, uh, you know, buy a business, you know, buy an apartment building, right? Or go on some other people and do the same. You know, storing value in sterile assets of money does no good for anybody. We want our uh, economic surplus to be uh, spent on productive assets, and particularly on creating new productive assets, uh, not uh, in the sterile form of money, which uh, does nothing for anybody. Earlier, you talked about having markets without having hyper you know, financialization of those markets. What does that look like and how, how would that work? I'm not sure. Uh, but you know, I would say one thing is uh, there should be very strong counter pressure to size. Uh, you know, one of the, if we think about the theory of markets, uh, you know, which is so funny, the market purists, they forget to tell you, oh, yeah, all that math that shows markets are highly efficient. They assume some things which aren't true about our current markets, uh, which is that everybody has complete and equal information and equal market power and that nobody has market power, uh, which essentially means there's lots of players. To so the degree we allow huge concentration in markets, you know, that uh, InBev controls 40% of the beer market. They control not only the price on the sale of beer, but they also control the price on ingredients, so-called monopsony, which is the opposite of monopoly. And so there should be a very rigorous counterforce to largeness in economic uh, units. I have a very simplistic uh, proposal, may or may not be a good one, but I'll just throw it out there, uh, which is the gigantism tax. Any company that reaches a billion in sales uh, pays 1% uh, of their revenue per billion of their revenue per year, capped at 20%. So a company of 15 billion a year in revenue is paying a uh, one uh, is paying 15% of their revenue or 2.25, I think they're right, 2.25 billion tax on their gigantism, right? Uh, and that tax also goes to the uh, citizen's dividend and is recycled per capita back to the citizenry. And, and if you want to be big, be big. But you better be really good and big to be able to outcompete uh, smaller entities that aren't being hit by this gigantism tax. I've been involved with a bunch of 
you know, some pretty big size companies. And I tell you the dirty little secret, many big companies don't need to be big. Uh, there are, that's not because you have to be big to be a media company. These are aggregations of a bunch of small properties, uh, mostly using tax uh, manipulation, you know, some buying power in advertising and a few other things. If there was even a modest 10% gigantism tax on them, they would bullet break back up into the, uh, into the in separate pieces instantly. Same with Walmart. There's no reason a retail store needs to be gigantic. Uh, there's no reason a retail store business can't operate at the level of your county, right? Uh, and there'd be some wholesalers, there'd be a hierarchy of wholesalers. And maybe there's some of them would be big. They could survive under the uh, gigantism tax, but maybe they wouldn't be. And, uh, you know, same with restaurants. You don't fucking need to have McDonald's. Fuck that, right? We got along fine for, uh, you know, a long time without having gigantic multi-billion dollar restaurant chains. Starbucks, fuck Starbucks, right? In my little town, we ain't got no stinking Starbucks. We got four independent, maybe five now, independent coffee shops downtown. Uh, we do have a Starbucks out by the interstate, but, uh, uh, you know, that's basically for the tourists to drive by. Would you have antitrust or how would you prevent this? Well, I'd, I'd add antitrust. I'd first start with the anti-gigantism tax, right? And, uh, you know, yeah, if, Star- if Starbucks can survive, you know, 7 or 8% tax on its gross revenues, I mean, a gross revenue tax is a high fucking tax, right? All, it's, you know, it gets you where it hurts the worst, right? If they can survive against the little guy with that, well, maybe okay, right? But then I would also add in a much more rigorous antitrust. And as a starting place, unless there's a compelling reason, uh, I would say uh, no company with sales over a billion dollars can buy another company with sales over $50 million, period. Now, there may be some cases where it's in the public good for that to happen, but it would be their duty to prove it. I think uh, guilty until proven innocent on co- big companies buying other companies, uh, period. You know, they're out to extract monopoly rents. Why the fuck do you think they're doing it, right? Another thing you've, you've got pretty deep on uh, is uh, complex systems. And complexity science, and you, you've had some podcast episodes on it, but you obviously done you know a lot of research, a lot of thinking about it. What, what do you wish the public uh, or Game B or, or just generally understood about complex systems or complexity science? Well, and uh, I think my biggest takeaway, and the one I hope that anybody who seriously studied complexity uh, takes away, is how unpredictable the future is. Right? Uh, that by their very nature, for deep scientific reasons. Systems that consist of the dance of lots of lower level uh, components are very difficult to predict very far into the future, particularly when they're strategic, i.e. social systems. The thing that makes social systems different than physical systems, uh, you know, a bunch of uh, billiard balls uh, uh, bouncing around a table, one of them doesn't suddenly decide to trick the other. But when you get to social systems, humans are figuring out how to game the system they're in all the time. And when you add those elements uh, into a complex system, uh, the ability to, to say with any precision what's going to happen out really far uh, is very modest. So I would say uh, predictive modesty is the biggest thing people should take away. But they shouldn't give up. They shouldn't become nihilist. Uh, one of the other things that uh, I've learned from my own work and studying the work of others is that you can build models and they don't catch every detail and they're not right. And no one scenario from a model is correct, particularly if you build a stochastic model. But you can get some ideas about the, the variance of the ensemble of results. Are we in a situation where the results are fairly similar? Are we in a system where sometimes it goes like this and sometimes it goes like that? I think that's uh, very much worth thinking about. And when it comes now to applying systems thinking to operate, social operating systems, uh, you know, again, modesty is the first rule. Yes, it's great to have some, and, and you should think this stuff through and put some markers down. Uh, but, you know, maybe you strongly state it, but you hold it weakly. Be ready to change. Have an experimentalist perspective. Uh, try stuff. And, uh, you know, don't think that you can predict three levels of indirection in a complex system. Really? You know, some people's, uh, Robert Wright has a book called Non-Zero, where he talks about how history has a direction and it, and it goes towards increasing social complexity over time. And that his implication is that we either need to sort of globalize effectively uh, or there'll be utter chaos. But what do you think of the um, underlying sort of principle of sort of history having a direction or, or a likely direction? Yeah, it's, I think that's a way to point it is a likely direction. Uh, one of the things about evolution is that increased complexity is not a, a guaranteed result, right? And we know of 
creatures that have become less complex, which is quite interesting. Uh, but it does seem to be an empirical fact that uh, the universe has gotten more complex. And once we transitioned over to our kind of life, uh, where we had high fidelity replication uh, and, and Darwinian evolution could kick in, then there's been a, a definite arrow towards more and more complexity. And as I said, I don't believe it's a necessity, but it is the way to bet. The uh, going, going forward, what, what are some of the, uh, the biggest questions or biggest topics of interest that, that you are trying to answer for yourself and in your own research and your own thinking? Uh, well, sort of put in the thinking uh, first, uh, you, know, you mentioned on globalization. Uh, I think the idea of a glo- one global government is a bad idea until we have at least three planets, right? You know, I, I, I like competition. I like the, the, you know, the proof case. It was, you know, it was wonderful that Marxist-Leninism had to compete with liberal democracy. Uh, you know, if there had been one global government and had been Marxist-Leninist, how the fuck do you ever get out of that, right? Uh, but the fact that liberal democracy could demonstrate over a period of years it was vastly superior uh, was good. But on the other hand, we are now confronting a whole series of global level questions. And you can cook it all down to climate change, right? Uh, If you you can't solve climate change, uh, we're fucked, right? Uh, So whatever it is we need to do at the global level uh, has to be able to be demonstrably sufficiently strong to solve solve climate change. And I don't know the answer there. Uh, You know, it may be... uh, cooperation at the nation state level, you know, as a, for, as a, for instance, uh, you know, a hefty and rising carbon tax, but then also that has a carbon tariff. So if my country has a 25% carbon tax, uh, or let's be more explicit, $200 a ton for carbon tax and yours doesn't, if you want to import anything into my country, I'm going to slap tariffs on your imports equal to, more than $200 per ton of carbon. Maybe you get emergent coercion that way. I'm not sure. But it is a huge question to me because if we don't solve that problem, we're fucked. But I'm not happy with the idea of a world government as the way to solve it. Yeah. And what's your punchline on why uh, liberal uh, democratic liberalism is is, is failing um, or is, is decreasing in popularity or hasn't been working in? Middle East or some of these other countries where we've been trying it. Because it's been corrupted. You know, it's, people figured out how to hack it with money. And it's, uh, you know, it's totally corrupt outside of the, the advanced West. And it's significantly corrupt in the advanced West. Uh, you know, globalism, for instance, uh, was a con job done on the people for the benefit of the capital. And it was done through our politics, right? And of course, people should be fucking pissed off. It's amazing there aren't guillotines on the street. Uh, is what I would say. Why, why is neo-fascism working? Not a, oh, in China? Uh, well, one, they have the advantage that they're in catch-up mode, right? Uh, we know that if your economy is less uh, energetic and advanced than the most advanced countries in the world, you have a huge windfall of technologies you can just imitate. Uh, if you're also a very tightly controlled dictatorship with an excellent spy service, you can go out and steal stuff. Uh, and so they have had that advantage. They also, but, but that may not be all. Uh, it may be that particularly in this era of social media, uh, that being a dictatorship uh, has some functional advantages. I'm not sure. I hope not, but it might be true. Uh, they can do a better job of policing bad faith discourse. Of course, on the other hand, they can be bad faith discourse. So it's a yin and a yang there. Uh, You know, if it were a completely benevolent dictator, maybe it would be okay. But, of course, we know from uh, history and from James Madison and others uh, that the idea of a benevolent dictator may happen for a while, but it's not the way to bet for it to last in the long term. So I think it's too early to tell if the Chinese neo-fascist model uh, is actually stable. Uh, We won't know until they come closer to advanced Western country level of uh, per capita income. We'll have to see how we choose to adapt to the poisoning of our discourse uh, and how we learn to police it in a way that's congruent with our social norms and our political system and see if we can. If we can't, we might be fucked. Yeah. And then and last punchline, then we'll close. What enabled capital to corrupt politics? Was it deregulation? Was it the, the, the uh, rise of, of markets just brought generally culturally? What enabled cap- like it to disrupt the political systems? Oh, it's funny. I think it uh, was, again, multiple 
multiple pieces and it was evolutionary. Uh, and I think interestingly, and this is where libertarians are right. Uh, some of my libertarian friends say, well, we wouldn't have to worry about uh, money corrupting politics if government were small. Uh, when government got bigger after World War II, uh, it became a much bigger win to uh, corrupt government, right? And, and and as the regulatory state started to grow more intense in 1970s and onward, uh, there became much more measurable economic benefit to uh, suppressing or corrupting uh, the regulatory process. Now, I'm going to tell you a personal story. When I uh, came in at uh, CEO of Network Solutions, we were in the middle of quite a, uh, a food fight. Uh, with the U.S. government about our uh, contract to operate the domain name system, right? Very political. There's all kinds of factions fighting on Capitol Hill. And uh, that was not supposed to be my area of forte. I didn't know dick about it, right? But I looked into what the people that were doing it were doing. I said, they're not fighting anywhere near hard enough they're, because they all have vested interests in careers in politics, right? They can't be a total asshole. I can be a total asshole, right? Because uh, I don't give a shit if I uh, never am in the good graces of a political person again. Uh, and I quickly realized we were underspending on lobbying grossly. Uh, I tripled our lobbying budget in one year uh, because it was so cost effective to corrupt uh, the uh, uh, institutions of politics. It paid off so obviously well. Now, these were soft corruptions. These were campaign contributions, you know, in return for listening to us, you know. But truth of the matter is on an issue that the general public has no interest in, doesn't understand in the slightest, the governance of the domain name system, uh, you know, you slop around uh, campaign, came, uh, campaign contributions enough, uh, you'll get your way. Really? Uh, I think that's a good place to close on my sense of your time. My guest today has been Jim Rutt. You can check him out on the Jim Rutt show. Uh, uh, episodes are fantastic. Uh, check uh, him out on Medium and on Twitter. Uh, and anywhere else you want to you point people to, Jim? The uh, Game B group on Facebook. Perfect. Go to Facebook, up to the search box, type in Game B, all one word, and you'll find it. If you're an early stage entrepreneur, we'd love to hear from you. Please hit us up at villageglobal.vc slash network catalyst. 